How do we bring people to Christ? What do repent and be in Christ mean? How does one become born again? Do you remember the moment you were born again? How did it happen for you? Would you share your experience with us in the comments section? I want to know. It is my great honor to welcome each and every one of you to this week's episode of The Doctrine of Christ, because whether you know it or not, the doctrine of Christ is the most important thing in your life. And we're bringing to a close season seven of the DOC, which means we've got 140 episodes of the doctrine of Christ that are out there for people to study and benefit from. We're so thankful for that. And as we conclude this seventh season, we're going to do it by answering some of the questions that our DOC listeners have sent in. And, and Jimmy, I'm just thankful to the Lord for this journey and for the blessings the Lord has put upon it. This next question was a very, very good question. It's another question that all of us think about. It involved when do we say something and how do we bring people to Christ and and how do we talk to people about Jesus? And I, this is something we all struggle with, I believe. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to read from three of the really profound soul winners. If you would want to learn how to fish, you would want to go to the people that catch a lot of fish. And these are three men that devoted their life to soul winning, teaching other people how to win souls, and the fruit they bore is a matter of record. And those three men would be R.A. Torrey, Samuel Bringle, and, and Charles Spurgeon. So we're going to go to um, these wise counselors. Like we always say, we have one teacher. That's the Holy Spirit through the word of God, but we can have many wise counselors. And I think in this instance, it's good for us to, to have some wise counselors now. And the, the actual answer to that is that I can't tell you the Holy spirit has to tell you when to speak, when to be silent. And he will, if we're in a relationship with him, he will lead us to be able to bring souls to Christ. Now, Ari Tori, his advice is this. He says, Christ's conversation with the woman of Samaria in the fourth chapter of John is a very instructive illustration. Ask them, and, and he's referring to the fact that Jesus asked her questions, and that's how he developed the, the conversation to teach and impart truth to the woman at the well by asking her questions. And Brother Tory says, ask them if they are Christians or if they are saved or some similar question. And it's often best to win a person's confidence and affection before broaching the subject. It is well to select someone and then lay your plans to win him to Christ. Cultivate his acquaintance, show him many attentions, and perform many acts of kindness, great and small. And at last, when the fitting moment arrives, arises up the great question. When it arrives, take the great, great question. Now, a lot of times when we have people we know, we can develop a relationship like Brother Tory says. But there's some people that pass through our life, we see them, and we'll never see them again. And there's that one window of opportunity where our paths intersect, and that's where we have to listen to the Holy Spirit and be able. Christ had never seen the woman at the well before, yet by asking her questions, he was able to bring that woman to a godly conversation and to faith in him as the Messiah. He says, uh, a wisely chosen track placed in the hand of the one with whom you wish to speak will often lead easily and naturally to the subject. And that's something that uh, a lot of people don't use anymore, but 
tracks can be very effective. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, how effective these days do you think handing somebody a track is going to be? You know, because it's not, I don't know, it's not something that's so uh, normal anymore, I guess. But especially it with is. today's technology and stuff. It isn't. That is old school, but yet old school can still work. Um, a lot of times I think we think to new school uh, on things. But the way people think, they're just not as likely to read something as they are to, um, you know, see something on their phone or on the Internet. Um, he gives some examples here. He says, it is easy to ask the person if he is happy, and when he answers no, you can say, I can tell you of one who will make you happy. Are you a Christian? Are you saved? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Have you eternal life? Are you confessing Christ openly in the world? Are you a friend of Jesus? Have you been born again? When we have learned where the person with whom we are dealing stands, the next thing to do is to lead him as directly as we can to accept Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Master. And these are just ideas and suggestions, and it has to be the Holy Spirit that leads you, uh, and he will. He will lead you to speak to people. Yeah, and I just keep thinking about that scripture that says, you know, some plant, some water, but it's up to God to bring the increase. So, yeah. and and then when we think about scriptures like we've covered some in this this series, I mean this season about how, uh, you know, God is the one who draws us to Himself first. Anyway, so if He's going to lead us to talk to someone that He's already started to draw a lot of times, so mm-hmm. if we feel the uh, inclination, if somebody catches our eyes and we're thinking, I probably should talk to that person, it's probably because God's already started dealing with that person, and maybe something you are going to go say is going to be the thing that, you know, pushes them over the edge towards God, which is a good thing. That is such a great point, Jimmy. And the Holy Spirit within us can sense the Holy Spirit's working within that individual. Mm -hmm. There's a witness of the Spirit there, and that is such a great point. Yeah, and one other thing real quick is, I'm just speaking for me, you know, a lot of times maybe I would feel uh, afraid or nervous that if they rejected, you know, my invitation or my whatever I said to them, I would feel like they were rejecting me. But we have to remember that they're not rejecting us. If they do reject us, they're rejecting God himself. Yeah. And we so we need to remove that from our mindset, I guess, when we go to approach somebody. It's like, and if somebody just totally rejects us, you say, well, okay. Because again, like that scripture says, some some plant, some water, it's up to God to bring the increase. So they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting Christ himself. And that is such a great point for us to remember. Even when we share the gospel, even when we are rejected, that is doing its job. That is doing its job. The word of God will not return void. That is planting that seed. Such a great point, Jimmy. Yeah, and you don't know later on down the road, that seed that you just planted right then may get watered a time or two more, and then they repent. And give their life to the Lord. Absolutely right. Yep. Absolutely right. Uh, Brother Samuel Bringle would give this advice. This book is entitled The Soul Winner's Secret. And he says this, while harshness and severity will only harden the wanderer from God, on the one hand, a gospel of gush will fill him with indifference or contempt on the other. How, now, how did he that, spell that? G-U-S-H. Okay, a, that's the first time I've ever heard that word. A gospel of gush. And that is his way to describe what has now become prevalent in America, a gospel of gush. That 
totally emphasizes and how we have to emphasize the love of God, but totally leaves out the aspect of repentance, the gospel of gush. So does that mean like we're just, we just, I mean, break that down. What what would be an example of that? Well, well, we're just talking about all the good things about God, but we never tell anybody to repent. Just very specifically. Something like that. Charles Ryrie, in his book on Bible doctrine, and he's a big dispensationalist. There's the Ryrie Study Bible. And Dr. Ryrie says that repentance, which is the Greek word matano, it does not, it just means, and the word in its root means to change your mind. And he says repentance is just to change your mind about who Jesus is and does not involve turning from sin. This is the point that has been bought into by Charles Stanley and that whole um, gospel of Gush. This is the foundational principle of the modern uh, sin revolution, I call it, not the grace resolution revolution, where repentance has been removed. So what you do to get saved, you just change your mind about who Jesus is. And, you know, the the Gush evangelist, uh, they would say, do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Yes. Uh, Well, will you accept him? Well, no, I'm doing this, that, the other. I can't accept Jesus. Well, you just have to believe who Jesus is. If you just believe who he is, you're saved. And they'll say, well, the rest will come later. Don't worry about that. That's the gospel of Gush that saves people in their sin instead of from their sin. Okay. And that's been around for a long time. Mm. But today, it's driving the bus, if you will. That mentality is driving the bus here in the good old USA. And and what Mr. Bringle says, that the gospel of gush is just going to fill that person with indifference. You know, they'll say, and a lot of times I've seen people, um, I went out to, we were having dinner one time with someone and he would brag about how many souls he won to Christ and the waitress come to the table and he would just corner her in front of everybody. And she finally says, oh, OK, OK, I'll get saved. Yeah. <laughs> and it just to shut the guy up, you know, and that's not salvation at all. But he goes on to say the soul winner then must not have the hardness and brittleness of glass or cast iron. Now, I remember in Evansville one year at the fall festival, there was a guy down there and he finally got arrested and he was preaching and he would, you know, the women out there, and certainly there were some women that were not dressed properly. We'll just say it like that. But he would say, Hey, you, you whores, you whores out there, (laughs) you know? And he had a lot of people that were ready to knock knots on his head and the police arrested him before he got his tail whipped. But that's not how to do it. That is, as um, Brother Brother Bringle said, the hardness and brittleness of glass or cast iron. He says, nor the malleability of wrought iron or putty. You know, we don't want to be just like putty, you know, putty, you can, uh, just mold any way you want, but rather the strength and flexibility of finest steel that will bend, but never break that will yield and yet retain its own form. And this is something that the Holy spirit will help us with. As we deal with people, we have to show them the love of God. And we also have to show them the judgment of God and the consequences of rejecting Christ. But if this is done in a harsh, fleshly manner, it will not avail. And if it's done as the way Brother Bengal, I love that word, the gospel of gush. If it's presented in a gospel of gush way, if the facts of the gospel 
and the consequences of their sin and the need of repentance aren't there, nothing will avail. Nothing will avail. Brother Bringle goes on to say, there is but one way. It is a fruit of the spirit, and it has to be had down at Jesus' feet. To maintain this spirit, you must walk in the footsteps of Jesus and feed on his words. Feed on his words. That's what Brother Bringle said it takes to be a good soul winner and be led by the spirit to feed on Jesus' words. I couldn't give any better advice mm. than that. Yeah, that's great. You don't hear that much anymore, do you? Mm -mm. You don't hear that much anymore. Charles Spurgeon, in his book, How to Win Souls for Christ, Brother Spurgeon, he says this, our object is to turn the world upside down, or in other words, that where sin abounded, grace may much more abound. We are aiming at a miracle. It is well to settle that at the commencement. You know, when you go out and you're you're talking to someone about Jesus, you're aiming at a miracle, nothing less than that, a miracle that will take place in this person's life. Some brethren think that they ought to lower their note to the spiritual ability of the hearer, but that is a mistake. According to these brethren, you ought not to exhort a man to repent and believe unless you believe that he can, of himself repent and believe. My reply is a confession. I command men in the name of Jesus to repent and believe the gospel, though I know they can do nothing of the kind apart from the grace of God. For I am not sent to work according to what my private reason might suggest, but according to the orders of my Lord and Master. Ours is the miraculous method, which comes of the endowment of the Spirit of God, who bids his ministers perform wonders in the name of the holy child Jesus. We are sent to say to blind eyes see, to deaf ears hear, and to dead hearts live. And that can only take place. Nothing we can do can bring that about apart from giving them the gospel, the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, and that if you repent and place your faith, just like that in that other question, that he died for you, he took the penalty of his sins upon you. And if, if we can lead a person to the foot of the cross, the Holy Spirit can give them the ability to believe. And it's a miracle. Like Brother Spurgeon said, we're aiming at a miracle. So he was saying that don't dumb it down because you think they may not know anything. That's what he was saying. Yeah. Just yeah. tell them the truth straight up. Yeah. And let the and, Holy Spirit tell them. And a lot of people, I think they shirk back from talking about repentance because they're afraid they're going to offend people and they'll gush it down or they think people might not be able to understand the gospel's the power of God and there's only one gospel and we we have to present that gospel for that miracle to take place besides the most famous verse in the whole bible what would be uh, how would you go about it when you first talk to somebody would you would you is there an, another scripture that you would just lay out on them that just encompasses that that gospel truth in, a, in, in, in just a nugget, you know, that they can grasp? No one says it better than Jesus. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent, believe the gospel. If you repent of your sins and you believe that Jesus died for you and surrender your life to him with believing faith, that's when the miracle takes place. It's great. It is great. 
It is great. It is absolutely great. Now, this next question dovetails in with the last. And the question was, how do I be born again? Now, isn't it amazing? And I I don't mean this in any way derogatory to the person that asked the question. But we talk about new birth all the time. Yet we have a listener that doesn't understand how to be born again. Mm -hmm. This shows how important it is to talk about the gospel over and over and over. I remember years ago, there was a young lady. This is way back years ago. But a young lady come to us that was having a lot of problems, and she was a regular church attender. And she was involved in the church she was going to. And when we began to question her about new birth and salvation, she didn't know what it was. She did not know. She was in church. She was involved. But yet she did not know what it meant to be born again. Hmm. And we were able to lead this young lady to Jesus. And her problems went south. And... This just goes to show how little that the real gospel is being presented. How often is it the gospel of gush, as Brother Brangle would say, rather than the real gospel? And for this reason, it's incumbent upon us often, often to present the gospel, how an individual is born again, because without new birth, unless you're born again, you you will not enter the kingdom of God. And I believe because of the gospel of Gush, which is totally of satanic origin, there's only one gospel. You know, Paul said in Galatians, if anyone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. Now, when we come to a person and we tell them that Repentance just means changing your mind about who Jesus is. If you just believe he's God, you know, you're saved. You don't have to turn from your sins. Now, that does two things. It makes that person think that they're saved. And it seals their soul for hell because they think they're saved and right with God and they're not. That's why there's a curse on any other gospel. So it's very, very important for us to give a clear and succinct answer to this listener's question. How do we born, are we born again? And it's amazing, this of people that are in mainline churches, the amount of people that would not understand how to be born again would truly be frightening. But we'll go to R.A. Torrey in a book called What the Bible Teaches, And we'll read just a little bit here. He says, all we have to do with our regeneration is to receive Christ. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 17. Let's read that familiar text. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that means to be in relationship with him. Uh, I am the vine, you're the branches. If any man abide in me, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What makes us a new creature is being in Christ. That is what causes this miraculous transformation. It's not from us. And the vehicle to bring us into Christ is the gospel. That's why it's so important to present the gospel very clearly and often, uh, goes on to say, Brother Tory does, in the new birth, the word of God is the seed, the human heart is the soil, the preacher is the word, is the sower, and drops the seed into the soil. God, by his spirit, opens the heart to receive the seed. The hearer believes The spirit quickens the seed into life in the receptive heart 
the new divine nature springs up out of the divine word. The believer is born again, created anew, made alive, passed out of death into life. And this is a very good description of what it means to be born again. And just like in a lot of your new Bible translations, there's Bible words that are very important that go away, Um, like justification by faith. And, you know, today it's, well, are you saved? Well, I remember one DOC that we did. The word saved, it means you can say properly, I am saved now, I am being saved, and I will be saved. Yeah, I remember that. Because salvation isn't completed until we leave this world. Now, today, that word has been redefined, and saved means that there has been some point in time where you have prayed a sinner's prayer or made some kind of profession of who Jesus is, and that event secures you of your final destination. A lot of people use Romans 10, 9, Mm -hmm. where it just simply says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And they'll just take that as, that's it, that's all you got to do, and you shall be saved. And that's not at all what Paul's saying, like, that's all you have to do. That's, that's one verse in the middle of a whole book dealing with all this stuff, and where he clearly more often talks about it's a lifelong thing. It's a, you, probably the verse you just talked about was, was that one of his? The yes. am and being and shall be, was that, well, yeah, was that a Paul all, verse? I know we brought multiple texts to bear on that. We had a lot of scriptures we gave on that. Now, actually, this scripture is all we have to do to come into Christ. Right. But they misinterpret it as yeah. they do everything. Now, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes confessing him as your Lord. And what's it mean if he's your Lord? That means he's the boss and you're the applesauce. And you do what he says. There's a lot that goes in that little sentence, isn't there? Yeah, Lord means obedience. And um, he is your Lord, that whatever he says, you don't question, you don't argue. You do it. And there was a time when people understood that following Jesus meant to follow Jesus and obey him. And without, and here again is this concept of obedience, repentance, and turning to Christ with a believing, obedient heart, willing to follow him. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that is a great verse, but like so many of the text, they're just twisted um, out of context into this gospel of gush, as Brother Bringle would put it. I love that. Um, And it is just simply our faith in the gospel. Paul said in the epistle of Romans that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and we have to ever uh, keep that in our mind that it's the gospel and not us, and our job is to give them the gospel, and the Holy Spirit will enable them to believe. Um, In the book of Acts, chapter 16 and verse 14, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us whose heart the the Lord opened when she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. What a beautiful way to put. And of course, the Bible puts everything beautifully, doesn't it? Yeah. But that's how it works. We 
whose heart, let's just read it again. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened when she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And prayer, prayer is a big part here. We pray for people that we're going to speak to, that when we speak the things of God, the Lord will open their heart. We are called to give a defense and an intelligent answer to the attacks upon our faith that are brought. But in the bottom line, it's faith in the raw facts of the gospel that are presented. Now, Paul said to the Greeks, this is foolishness. But unto us that believe, it's the power of God, you know. And this seems, um, you know, a lot of people, they'll, they'll try to be persuasive and they'll try to use um, intellectual persuasion. And there's an intellectual element to it to remove stumbling blocks in the minds of people. There is that. But in the raw, the raw form, when the tire hits the road, it's the gospel and the Holy Spirit working within the individual to, to bring them to that place of salvation. With all of my heart.